Welcome to The Spinner Room. I'm Elon Levy. Today we're joined by Moti Yogev, a member of the Israeli parliament. He represents the far-right Jewish Home Party and is a retired army colonel. Welcome, sir. On our agenda today, one diplomacy will talk how the Jewish Home Party wants to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Two, security will look at developments in Israel and the wider Middle East. And finally, politics will grapple with some of the hot-button issues animating Israeli society. Okay, let's begin. Uh, Mr. Yogev, does the Israeli-Palestinian conflict have a solution? Yes, it does have a solution, but in one direction, of our holding uh, the land of Israel and the understanding that the Palestinian state was never here and will never be here. And uh, every time that we tried with Oslo Accord and with withdrawal from Gaza to give the Palestinians uh, territory, they made it a basis for terror, and it caused us a lot of damage. And therefore, the one direction to maintain our holding of uh, the territories and to eradicate terror, but that of course has to do with the Israeli consensus. So you're talking about annexing the whole of the West Bank or Judea and Samara, Samaria imposing Israeli sovereignty. When you say this is a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, do you expect this will end the violence, that we will live at peace with the Palestinians in such a scenario? This is the opportunity after we withdrew unilaterally from Gaza and we see what happened there, Hamastan and uh, missiles and uh, tunnels and they continue to gather weapons, although they know we're going to win. This is an opportunity to do what we think, what uh, the faith of Israel for generations and the uh, security because of uh, reality. Yes, we have to hold, I'm not uh, saying to give citizenship to all two and a half million. Arabs who live in the West Bank, but they know also that under, under our control, their economic situation, their life is better than any other Arab country, and therefore we will be committed both to security and to humanitarian needs as uh, residents, uh, maybe autonomy, municipalities, whatever, and uh, the Naftali Bennett uh, program is at the first stage to annex all the sea zones with all the settlements there. They will be under the Israeli sovereignty, and in the future, and I really consider also the Israeli consensus. Yes, we're going to expand our sovereignty between the Mediterranean and the Jordan. There was and there'll be only one country, Israel. So in your vision, we annex Judea and Samaria. We have a one-state solution. Does that bring peace? Yes or no? Yes, for sure, for sure. When it will be obvious to the Palestinians that all this reality is imaginary and our intentions are clear, what is going to eradicate terror is uh, because, you know, terror is done because they think that we're going to surrender. But when they understand that we do not surrender, and it's obvious in reality that uh, security and the IDF, what we do and we try to eradicate terror, uh, so... Uh, in the Israeli public opinion, it's going to happen, you know, after this unilateral withdrawal from Gaza, or the deportation as they call it, and we saw that we failed. And in Oslo, we saw, we saw that uh, nothing happened in Judea Samaria, and uh, we needed to return our control on Judea and Samaria. So it depends on Israel only, and it's important for us also to strengthen our force in the Israeli public, and the entire people of Israel, so that we can advance in this way more than we're doing at the moment. Yeah, in this scenario of annexation, do the Palestinians receive full citizenship? Are they equal citizens to the Jews who live in the land of Israel? No, I didn't say at the time. It's still far from apartheid. Apartheid wants to oppress the other people. We don't want to oppress. Anybody who wants to live in peace with us will live in peace. They will get their humanitarian full rights, the full equality, and voting for the Knesset, not yet. It's a demographic uh, process. It is for the benefit of the people of Israel, both in natural growth. The uh, people of Israel are in the OECD. They're the first First, in natural uh, growth, we have uh, more than 25,000 olim to this country, where uh, the Arabs are going down, they're leaving the country, and also they don't have such birth rates. So and the horizon is only for the benefit of the people of Israel, demographic as well, and we're not going to make decisions now. Now we'll do it stage by stage. We want to strengthen our hold in Judea and Samaria and have a situation with no Torah to control the area.
You mentioned the apartheid word, not me, but you say we shouldn't be making all the decisions now. We'll postpone a decision on whether to give the Palestinian citizenship rights. But surely you can see it's problematic for a state that calls itself democratic to take control over an area and have millions of people under its control who are not citizens. I mean, is that not a problem for you as a Democrat, presumably? There are many areas in the world that the reality is much harsher and the people are oppressed. Palestinians in Judea and Samaria, not only are they not oppressed, but they live their uh, better, better life than any Arab country. In the Arab countries around us, in Syria, in war, Jordan or Egypt, there's no electricity 24-7. No electricity every day. Sometimes they don't have water, like in the Gaza Strip. In Judea and Samaria, they all have electricity. 24-7, they have running water, they have vehicles that uh, go sometimes better than ours. So this reality is a reality of life that for us, we want to live with them in peace, under our control, welcome. Anybody who wants to leave to get Arab citizenships, they have 20 Arab countries to do that. Anybody who wants to continue to fight, thank God we are strong, we'll be able to do it uh, now, as well. Why are you comparing Israel to neighboring Arab countries into Syria. I'm not asking you about whether the situation when we annex the West Bank and don't give the Palestinians voting rights would be better than Syria. I'm asking whether it is what a democratic country should do. Uh, does Israeli democracy matter to you? I don't know. I do not compare. I, of course, the Israeli democracy is very important for all citizens, also the Israeli Arabs. I don't compare ourselves to the Arab countries around us, but you have to know also the gap and our wish as Jews. Jew has uh, no uh, wish to kill anybody, not an Arab. It's not our education, it's not our uh, values, it's not our Torah, our religious. Uh, so I wanted to uh, tell you the difference between was oppression in South Africa or even today in many countries in the world, Israel does not oppress neither the Arabs in Judea, Samaria or in Gaza or anywhere else. On the contrary, when Israel was in Gaza, the situation there was better than they are today under the Hamas because uh, today the money goes to tunnels and to other things. When Israel controlled at a time in Judea, Samaria, we made sure that the education was good. They didn't uh, educate them for hate and for killing. We wanted them to study physics, mathematics, like people. Therefore, we're not afraid. We know exactly what is our values. Also, tomorrow morning, uh, we're not going to give citizenship to these Arab. Nevertheless, we're going to do that along the way when it's obvious that uh, we are over the demographic problems and everything that's happening around us, and we're looking and at it. And yet you keep on comparing uh, the situation to other countries. I want to understand from you, uh, how do you expect Israel Israel to remain both a Jewish and a democratic state if it has, for example, 40% Arab citizens who have uh, voting rights? Because at the same stage, first of all, we don't have 40% Arabs. The poll of the last year talked about 28.6% uh, without uh, the Arabs in Judea Samaria. And uh, in Judea Samaria, we're talking about 2.5 million Arabs. This, as I said, the demography of the Jews is on the rise uh, with Aliyah from abroad. And this gives. Uh, a rising bar of the ratio which is improving between us and the Arabs and uh, we're not going to give them overnight uh, citizenship it's still a democracy they're going to get autonomy they can, can control their own life uh, they can have autonomy but it's going to be as the uh, former prime minister said uh, Rabin it's less than a state but they're going to be the, their autonomy they can control and the, their life without our involvement in their inner life, yes, will have an impact on the education. We don't want the education of hate. We don't want to kill them. We don't want to kill anybody in the world. Unfortunately, the education in the Palestinian uh, okay, authority... I'm still struggling to understand whether we're talking about autonomy for the Palestinians or absorbing them into an Israeli state, but we have to go for a break. We'll continue this conversation in just a minute. We're going to be back. We're going to be back in just a minute on The Spin Room.
Americans have simply lost trust in news media. What happened to the news? All I get is a daily serving hey, lies. do your job and just tell me I the news. I am overloaded with news that is useless. Give me the facts. Let me sort it. Where's the integrity? The news is Why is the news so bad? I will never trust the media. Michelle McCory on I-24 News. Join me on Clear Cut, where we cut to the chase with a straightforward yet insightful breakdown of the world's top political and economic stories. Weeknights beginning at 7 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. Welcome back to the spin room. Here we have a member of the Israeli parliament, Moti Yogev, from the Jewish Home Party. Uh, Mr. Yogev, uh, help me understand something. Uh, the proposition of your party leader, Naftali Bennett, his so-called tranquilization plan, is to give the uh, Palestinians in the West Bank autonomy in certain islands and to connect them with tunnels and bridges so they don't have to go by any Israeli soldiers and they can go visit their families by tunnels and bridges. Uh, do you accept the Palestinians find this proposal humiliating? This uh, plan is actually happening today. It's the same plan of Menachem Begin. And they find the reality today humiliating. It's also a plan of the Prime Minister. They have a life which is better than any other Arab country. What they get in Judea and Samaria, they don't get in any other country in the Middle East. In Judea and Samaria, ask any Arab if he gives up his right to live in Judea and Samaria and he would be willing to go live in an Arab country, he would say that he lives better. I tell you, because he's got livelihood, he's, he can uh, support his family, this is our intention. That's where we're thriving for, in order to improve the life of the Arabs and in that uh, also to have security so that they're not going to go for terror, but they'll go for life, for mutual life. That's what we mean and that's where we're going. Yes, this is the plan of Naftali Bennett to do annex. Do you think, and this will bring better stability. Do you think that the Palestinians should feel grateful for living under Israeli occupation? I don't ask them to feel grateful. We believe in our justice. The justice is that the land of Israel belongs to the Jews of this country. We have Arab countries. By the way, I'll tell you a little anecdote that uh, uh, when Jesus was here 2,000 years ago, he didn't say a church. It happened 150 years later. He didn't see a mosque. It happened 500 years later. He only saw the second temple of the Jews. This is the history, this is the faith, and this is actually the reality and the security. These four legs, four pillars, it's obvious to all of us, unless okay. you Mr. imagine Yogev, things. Mr. Yogev, you keep on comparing the situation to other Arab countries. I'm trying to bring the conversation to what Israel should do as a democracy, so we're not getting anywhere on this subject, and we're going to go forward to the second subject. We're going to be looking at the question of security. Uh, you're a retired army colonel. I want to understand uh, uh, your view of things. Uh, let's have a look at the Gaza Strip, uh, a report now that 97 percent of the water in the Gaza Strip is not fit for drinking because it's polluted either with sewage uh, or with salt water. Are you concerned about what might happen if there's a real humanitarian disaster in Gaza? First of all, we have to understand that the withdrawal, the disengagement was a big mistake. We had a great struggle against uh, the disengagement because in the Gaza Strip, it's part of the uh, land of Israel and uh, also the destruction of the but settlement. But whether or not it was a mistake in the past, are you worried now that a humanitarian disaster will explode in our faces? Yes, I am. And because I said that what we can do and what the Israeli consensus agrees to, I think that we are committed to understand that we have responsibility, both security and humanitarian, to work in two parallel pillars, to hit terror when you need, and its heads and all these leaders of the Hamas that take all the money of the population in Gaza and they make it into terror instead of giving them a good life, and also to help humanitarily. 
There's a difficulty. We can supply electricity and water. We don't even get payment for it. But in the Gaza Strip, there is no infrastructure. That's why we need the cooperation of other countries. It was Qatar, now less. If we're talking about Iran, they are, so we don't have this combination because it's a combination of terror, not life. We have to look for partners in the world or within the Gaza Strip. I think we will have to uh, do away with the leaders of the terror and to make Gaza a tourist place, economic place. There are two million Arabs living there. They should live normal life. We are going to... Just so I can understand where you're going here, because of course in Israel we're always talking about when the next war will take place, not if. Are you suggesting that in the next war Israel should destroy Hamas, take over Gaza again, and then try to find local allies who could what, uh, set up a, a puppet government? Yes. Yes. In the Israeli population, uh, some people do think, but even in the army command, that are afraid that if we are going to eradicate the leaders of Hamas, there'll be nobody there to be in power because it's a mess there. There's uh, ISIS and there's Hamas. So Israel for Hamas at the moment is the fact that we can negotiate somehow uh, because we know the reality and maybe we can uh, make it more stable. I think that uh, uh, the evil is evil and evil has to be hit in order until we hit it until we finish all the leaders there no civil leadership is going to grow because they actually took control of the Gaza Strip I mean the, they alternative, killed anybody. To, the alternative to Hamas taking over is either Islamic Jihad or the Palestinian Authority which is currently having reconciliation talks with Hamas do you support the Palestinian Authority taking back control of the Gaza Strip Either if there's no other choice, Gaza challenges us, and nobody cares in the world about Gaza. Only we, Jews, we care about the people in Gaza. Also the uh, sick people, we, speak, we take care of patients in our hospitals. So one day maybe we'll be forced to uh, uh, wage war on Gaza, to control it, and unfortunately uh, people will be hurt both in Israel and Gaza. This is what I see realistic, although I would be very happy if it wasn't the situation, that uh, we want things to be better for us and for Israel, but uh, logic and reason doesn't work uh, on the Hamas. I uh, think we are going to peace, they're going to war, and this reality, unfortunately, is going to make us uh, through the feet or do the head will have to unfortunately and be forced when that happens, to control. Should Israel re-establish the settlements it demolished in 2005 in the Gaza Strip? That's a further future, and I, in my vision, of course, I see it because in the place where there was a settlement, there's more security. So it is in Judea, Samaria, so it is in Gaza after we leave. But you see what happened. No security, and even the country is now threatened in the far future. But of course, it all has to do with Israeli consensus. The Israeli public understands now more and more. Uh, they see the mistake about the disengagement and its connection to the land of Israel, most of the public knows that we're not going to withdraw from the clusters in the Jordan Valley. It's forever and ever is going to be part of Israel. These insights are created with the years, either through logic and the head, or as I call it, through the feet uh, on the ground. And this is going to happen, and uh, then of course we'll do this uh, step as well. Okay, well, let's focus on some of the challenges facing Israel. Since President Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital, we've seen an upsurge in rocket attacks from the Gaza Strip, has Israel lost its deterrence? All this is obvious. We have today an administration which is 180 degrees opposite to Obama. Obama saw us as the problem and saw Iran and the Palestinians as the solution. Thank God uh, the Trump administration sees in Iran a problem. The Palestinians are not a big problem, but they see in Israel a solution, a real ally. This thing we need with the administration to be cautious, but of course it advances us in the international 
international atmosphere we can stronghold Judea and Samaria and Jerusalem. It doesn't happen in leaps and bounds. It happens in small steps, but that's the direction. We want to strengthen our hold in Judea and Samaria, in Jerusalem, preventing okay, and eradicating we have terror. To go for another break. When we come back, we're going to be taking a look at some of the internal Israeli politics with Member of Parliament Moti Yogev. We're going for a very short break. Don't go away. is becoming increasingly connected. 6.5 million Wi-Fi enabled devices are now shipping every day. And global consumer internet traffic is growing exponentially with 2.8 billion internet users consuming video at a breathtaking rate. We are creating personalized mobile entertainment and communications breakthroughs that are connecting millions of people and billions of devices around the globe. We are Eris and we're powering your digital world. Join I-24 News for an exclusive interview with Karen Pence, the second lady of the United States and wife of Vice President Mike Pence, as they embark on a high-stakes visit to Israel. Tune into The Rundown at 1 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. News 24 is a Spanish-language weekly news magazine on I-24 News, presented by respected journalists Carlos Gurovich and Damian Pachter, bringing you news and analysis of the most important issues of the Middle East and Israel, with the added perspective of the impact on the Spanish-speaking world. News 24, Fridays only on I-24 News. Israel. The Middle East, the world. Get your daily dose every morning on I-24 News. News from around the world to around the corner. Jeff Smith brings you the top stories, the hard news, and analysis you need to know. Weekday mornings at 7.05 a.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. Welcome back to the spin room. We have Israeli Member of Parliament Moti Yogev from the Jewish Home Party. And Mr. Yogev, before we go into talking about uh, Israeli politics, uh, when discussing counter-terrorism in the past, you suggested that Israel should detain the families of terrorists and feed them only bread and water. Uh, would you do this for Jewish terrorists as well? Depends. It all depends. Uh, Jewish terror is not what uh, the Israeli society is uh, measuring. Uh, we had uh, an incident here and there. There was uh, some Arab, uh, they burnt a uh, uh, church. We do not encourage it. You don't uh, take people, we tell them to kill Arabs. On the contrary, you know, the police and the Supreme Court are with it. Unfortunately, so sorry, just, just, to un just to understand, Israeli citizens people who are full citizens of the state of Israel, y you would consider detaining them and feeding them nothing but bread and water even if they haven't committed a crime just because they're related to terrorists? <laughs> But, but you're open to that possibility. It all depends uh, what kind of deterrence you need, what other tools you need in order to deter those murderers. If the deterrence doesn't work, because they're sure that when they get to heaven, shahids, they're going to meet uh, 72 virgins, and the families will get 12,000 shekels. So if isn't working, you're okay with detaining innocent people who haven't committed a crime for the sake of deterrence, people who are full citizens of a State of the state of Israel. And then we need tools, stronger tools that are accepted in other places in the world. One is to demolish the house. If it was a terrorist. Specifically detaining the families of terrorists, I want to understand. That's going to save life because the family members, I spoke about it because the Supreme Court did not enable us to deport them abroad, not even to Gaza. And I said, okay, if they have to stay, if you uh, disrupt the life of the family, you know, that uh, group that just now murdered the rabbi, if you take the family members of those murderers and put them in the so desert. Just, just to conclude, because we want to get on, you're open to doing that for Jewish citizens of the state of Israel as well. 
But you said it depends. There's no need if you have if no other choice, because the reality, the social reality, the perception among that population, we're talking about the family members who support terror. terrorism. If they are supporting terror, then of course we need this deterrence and the punishment so that they understand. The terrorists should understand. Maybe my father or my mother. Cases of Jewish terrorism. Okay, Mr. Yogev, we have to go on. We have to go on to the next subject. We have to go on to the next subject. Protests in Israel now over the subject of uh, the mini markets law, which would shut down, keep supermarkets shut in Israel on Saturday. Uh, many calling this religious coercion. Is religious coercion okay in a Jewish state? I think that we have to go back to a different discourse. Now, at the 70th year, I thought about the unity of the Jewish people. It's very important. So I try less not to stick a finger in the eye of the member of Knesset. I want to talk about the problem itself, about the issue, and not to people, whether this minister or that's one, that's that minister. Not what I'm Do you accept that not allowing the secular public to live as they want by shutting down the mini markets on Shabbat is a violation of their religious freedom. It's religious coercion. It was uh, very clever of Ben Gurion at the time, of the status quo. You know, in my uh, street, uh, I can uh, take a car on Shabbat. We understood that. By the way, those buses who go, or people who don't have cars, if they have to go to a hospital or to go visit families, that's not a problem. But trade in Shabbat, we want to talk about the value of Shabbat, as Ahada Am said. He said that more than the people of Israel, the Jewish people kept the Shabbat, the Shabbat kept them, because God, through the people of Israel, he gave it to the world, so they need one day. You know, the Muslims have a day off on Friday, the Christians on Sunday, they don't uh, trade. They close the shops. In Israel, we do, because uh, the rich man comes, and he can buy, and then it uh, even disrupts the social stability. But uh, Shabbat uh, is a day of rest. It unifies the families. They can sit around the table, and they don't work and run around for seven days, all this thing is essential for the people of Israel, for the Jews. It was true for 2,000 okay, years in the diaspora, the in exile. I, I, I understand. You think it's very important to keep the status quo. Uh, there's talk of elections now within political circles. We see various parties maneuvering to get ready for elections. Some polls show that your party, the Jewish Home, could jump from 8 to 13 seats. When the elections come, how are you going to make sure you keep that support so the same people won't jump to the Likud at the last minute like last time? First of all, you saw, last time we didn't manage to maintain them. I think we have to consolidate ourselves with our ideology. Many people believe it. A unity, unification of this people with all its populations. Also to be connected to the Torah, to the tradition. People want roots. I'm not analyzing exactly what people are doing if they keep Shabbat or they go for a football game or whatever. But people who want to be connected to the tradition, to the roots, to this people, to this country, to this state. These are four pillars of the ideological perception of uh, Jewish and religious Zionism. I think many people want to expand the ranks. Yes, of course, we have to do it uh, the way so our minister is doing. how are you going to stop the Likud at the last minute stealing your votes when Netanyahu says, you have to vote for me so I can continue to be prime minister? Uh, we will be better, we will maintain the national camp and Netanyahu to be stronger. I don't think it's a conflict. I don't think they contradict. Eventually the people will decide, but we want to expand the circle of the voters uh, with the other uh, parties, uh, the traditional ones in the various other parties, or Shas even, uh, many populations in order to strengthen these four pillars. People of Israel, the land of Israel, Israel, love of Israel, tradition, etc. Okay. 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 from the Jewish Home Party, thank you very much. I'm afraid we have to go for a break. If we could carry on, we could carry on for a very long time. Monty Yogev from the Jewish Home Party, thank you very much for joining us. We're taking a very short break. We'll be back very soon with Price Gurus. Don't go away. I'm Lauren Izo on I-24 News. Join me on High Definition right here for an in-depth understanding of Israel's diverse society through groundbreaking documentaries. Join Lauren Izo weeknights at 10.03 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. 
I'm David Schuster on I-24 News. Join us on Stateside. It's our channel's flagship broadcast, and it features our best reporting and analysis of news from around the world and from here in the United States. Watch Stateside, weeknights at 9 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. U.S. Vice President Mike Pence is touching down in Israel this week, just as the Trump administration recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of the Jewish state. I-24 News will be there for every step the vice president takes in the Holy Land. Tune in Sunday through Tuesday, only on I-24 News. There's more to the news than meets the eye. Many voices, many faces, with interests often at odds. We take you deeper beyond the headlines, inside the drama, the controversy, bringing you fresh insights into the conflict, breakthroughs, heartaches, and victories shaping our world. Perspectives, there's more than just one view. Sunday to Thursday at 5.05 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. Every stone, every street, every scar tells the story of Israel. A place that speaks of the souls of Jews, Christians, and Muslims alike. Changed by time and conflicted, its magic still echoes in the hearts of its people. Join I-24 News' Jordana Miller on a journey through history. Watch Holy Land Uncovered every Sunday at 10.05 a.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. back to the spin room we're here with our segment press gurus with our three press gurus in the studio covering the whole range of the international media we have our senior middle east correspondent mohammed al qasim our diplomatic correspondent mike wagenheim and international affairs correspondent bianca zanini welcome all first subject on our agenda we're going to be looking at UNRWA, the united states cutting 65 million dollars to the united nations palestinian refugee agency i imagine that's being covered uh, very differently in all different papers uh, mike what's uh, how are the israeli press covering this. Well, take a look just from a, a factual standpoint. The Times of Israel interviewed the head of uh, UNRWA and basically what he said was that the U.S. freeze in this uh, funding is not related to our performance. It's sort of like when your boss tells you we're going in a different direction. Well, you know what that means. They just don't like the, the job you're doing. Unfortunately... It's you, not me. Well, I've, I've never been fired. <laughs> I've come close a few times. But uh, I think the, the main premise and what the Israeli media is basically saying is it doesn't matter specifically what the staff of UNRWA is doing or not doing. It's the very premise of their existence and the way Palestinian refugees are counted and how the money is distributed and what it's going to. That's the problem rather than specific job performance. And I think the, the head of UNRWA really is in a no-win situation here. And I think the Times of Israel really kind of detailed that and made him out to be a sympathetic character, which, which he sort of is. He's just boxed in and really doesn't matter what kind of job he does. It doesn't matter in the end. And do we have another headline from the Israeli press? We do. Let's take a look at Ynet here. And this is from Oded Shalom. Uh, making the case that Gazan workers uh, should be let into Israel uh, to sort of uh, alleviate uh, sort of the financial problems and the economic catastrophe that's going on in Gaza right now. We've seen for a long time work permits distributed to uh, Palestinian Arabs coming out of the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, but Gaza has really been off limits for a long time, even though the civil administration says it's a good idea, even some in the security services say it's a good idea. It's been a non-starter in the political echelon. The case being made in this particular article that it's time to end the, the bias, I guess, 
against the Gazans and to and try that to could certainly make a dramatic difference to Gaza's dire economic situation. Exactly. Um, Mohammed Al Qasim with the Palestinian media covering the same angle. Middle East, Arab, and Palestinian media massively uh, covered the uh, cuts by President Trump to honor well. Let's start with Al Qasim Al Arabi newspaper out of uh, London, where the major headline is Honor what pleads with the world to donate. Fatah rejects American blackmail. So there are two headlines within one headline. The first one that Honor what has started. It's uh, another campaign to uh, get some uh, donation to fill in or make up the difference that the U.S. Uh, uh, US uh, uh, aid uh, is leaving behind. But at the same time, Fatah, which is a major Palestinian uh, party, is saying that the U.S. is blackmailing the Palestinians. Therefore, they will not give in to that uh, to, to, to the U.S. Uh, cutting of, uh, of aid to UNRWA and even the threat to cut aid to the Palestinian Authority. Let's move on to Al Quds, a newspaper out of uh, East Jerusalem, and also a major headline on that. The following day, the U.S. Uh, decides to freeze 65 million of its aid to UNRWA. But underneath that, a couple of different head headlines where 100 different employees in Jordan have been let go by UNRWA. And also, UNRWA is saying that they will continue on providing services despite the cutting of aid, meaning that it puts the emphasis more on the ramifications of uh, cutting of aid to UNRWA and the services that UNRWA provides to the Palestinian refugees throughout the Middle East. Mohammed, I want to stand with this headline. Is there a sense within the Arab media of perhaps entitlement towards American aid money? I mean, do they see this as a legitimate foreign policy choice for America or money that the Palestinians? deserve from the international community. Of course, that's uh, part of what the United Nations mandate is and UNRWA, and they don't think that they are entitled to it. That is a right to these refugees until the international community takes on its responsibility and these refugees finds a final resolution, by, be it by returning to their homes or some sort of a political solution that is uh, achieved by the major uh, parties involved. And you have another headline for us. That's correct. A cartoon, and we love cartoons here. Yes, uh, we do. Press Guru, and this is from Al Arabi Al Jadid, another newspaper out of London, and it's really telling uh, of uh, of the whole situation. UNRWA is cr crippled by the dollar sign, which is the U.S. and the lock is Trump, where he locks in the aid coming in, and basically it says that Trump and financing UNRWA. That's the title, and how how UNRWA that provides on one hand educational uh, uh, services and on the other hand provides health services. Now it cannot really do its job as properly as it, uh, it used to before the uh, aid is suspended by the U.S. Okay, Bianca from the Israeli press, we're seeing possible opportunities for Gaza. The Arab press, we're seeing complaints about the aid cut. How are the international media covering this story? Very differently, and I decided to take two opinion pieces with uh, two very different opinions. The first one is from the forward from Lisa Goldman, and her main point here is that whether or not Onurah's mandate is politically desirable, that's beside the point, millions of people depend on it. So she's saying if there were no UNRWA schools, kids would be educated in Hamas Islamist schools. And is this really what we want? Mm. Some say that UNRWA is too closely tied to Hamas. Her point is that it's exactly the opposite. If it wasn't for UNRWA, UNRWA Hamas would have much more power. And so it's the if devil you know, at least. It's the devil you know. So she says if the U.S. wants UNRWA gone, they need to solve the actual issue, which is the issue of the refugees, not the UNRWA itself. Okay, and what that else have we got from the international papers? So, from Newsweek, actually this was uh, first um, uh, printed in, uh, in um, the Council of Foreign Affairs webpage by Elliot Abrams. He's an American diplomat, served under Bush, and he says that all other refugees are served by the UN Refugee Agency, and their core mission is to end the statelessness of these people. And his point is that UNRWA is going exactly up opposing this, is working opposed this, that the mission is to never end the statelessness. He says they have three times the staff as UNHRC, UNCRH, uh, but that it helps less. So he says that the, pri uh, the problem is not just financial, but also ideological. Because if I understand the argument is that whereas the role of the High Commissioner of Refugees is to find a permanent settlement for refugees, the role of, the, uh, of UNRWA is to it. perpetuate until the refugee uh, issue can be solved in final status. Mohammed, I want to understand from you, I mean, this is a very 
very interesting argument. Is there any uh, awareness discussion within the Palestinian media that maybe the refugee issue shouldn't be a final status issue, that maybe it's time to solve it now, to resettle refugees in Arab countries, maybe even to dismantle the refugee camps inside the West Bank? That's an non-issue, and I think that's even becoming a bigger issue because of what we're hearing uh, about the historic deal or the deal of the century that uh, President Trump has promised during his campaign regarding the uh, Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict. Or the slap of the century. Or the slap of the century, as uh, Pre President Abbas has called it last week. Palestinians are saying that this is a major issue, just like uh, Jerusalem, just like borders, just like the future state of Palestine, that it, it's part of this complex of many issues that needs to be discussed on the negotiation table, and you cannot, uh, you know, take one apart from the rest. And it, what what this uh, decision by President Trump is doing is that it turn is, is making the lives of these refugees is even worse. This okay. is a humanitarian Mohammed, issue more than anything break. else. Mohammed, Mike, uh, Bianca, we're going for a very short break. When we come back, we will be back with our press gurus for another look at what the international press is saying about the big issues. We'll be right back. What you need to know, the news, fast and to the point, and the in-depth interviews that will keep you in your seat from the people that you trust. I-24 News presents The New Rundown, every Monday through Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern, co-hosted by Nurit Ben and Kalev Ben David, only on I-24 News. Unflinching, opinionated. Weeknights, David Schuster and Shayna Estulin bring you analysis, interviews, and opinions that connect us to the Middle East and the world. Watch Crossroads weeknights starting at 6 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. I'm Emily Francis on I-24 News. Join us on Trending right here on the show that shines the light on the many amazing people doing positive work to inspire. This is the show about building bridges. Weekdays at 8 a.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. I'm Jordana Miller at I-24 News. Join me for the Holy Land Uncovered, a look at this remarkable land filled with so much faith and history and archaeology. Watch Holy Land Uncovered every Sunday at 10.05 a.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. I'm Tracy Alexander for I-24 News. Join us on Perspectives and get the whole picture as we break down the day's top stories from all angles. Back to the spin room. We're here with I24 News press gurus Mike Wagenheim, uh, Mohammed Al Qasim, and Bianca Zanini. In the last segment, you brought us what the Israeli, Arab, and international press have to say about US cutting its funds to UNRWA. This time, we've given you a free choice to pick your favorite international stories. Uh, Mike, what's your favorite story from the Israeli press this week? Well, I was really intrigued by an article in the Jerusalem Post from uh, Amot Asael talking about the supermarket law, the controversial bill that gives the interior minister the power to shut down supermarkets and other commerce on Shabbat throughout Israel. The article making the case, it's called Middle Israel, the Shabbat Gentiles. There's an old saying, the Shabbat Goy. Goy being Yiddish for Gentiles, sometimes used as a derogatory term, but not so much here. In exile, of course, Jewish people would use Goyim Gentiles to do some things for them on Shabbat that they were not allowed to do because those areas just weren't sh set up to be observing Jews in, in those particular areas. Like you know, switching on the light. Like switching on the light. Very convenient religious Shabbat, Lighting a candle, things like that. Here in Israel, the point in the article is Israel was set up so you don't need Shabbat Goyim anymore. However, recently, a member of the ultra-Orthodox United Torah Judaism Party, Moshe Gaffney, said we are going to enforce a new supermarket law by hiring thousands of Gentiles to observe what's going on and hand out fines to businesses that open on Shabbat. The point of the article is it's ridiculous in the state of Israel, after we had formed our own state here, that we now again need Gentiles to do our dirty work. Fascinating. Jewish state are very much sticking to old uh, diasporic themes. 
names, uh, Mohammed Al Qasim. I imagine uh, that's not what's coming up in the Arab press. No, it's not the uh, <laughs> Arab or Middle Eastern press. I think the issue of uh, President Trump's announcement, the uh, controversial announcement on Jerusalem, and the visit by Vice President uh, Mike Pence is making huge uh, issue or headlines, and this is one of them in the Ashraf Al Awsat newspaper out of London, Saudi supporting newspaper, and it says that Pence is seeking to calm the Jerusalem file or Jerusalem uh, decision uh, by his visit where he will he visited the Egypt Jordan and will be in Israel this is something that uh, Mike Pence has uh, scheduled before it was canceled rescheduled and he's back again let's see if he will be successful in trying to defuse the situation at least for a little bit okay uh, Bianca something completely different Please. my uh, my favorite story of this week is called the humiliation of Aziz Ansari it's a story that really brought an interesting twist and controversial twist Very in the Me Too campaign. The subtitle of this uh, of this title is Allegations Against the Comedian are Proof that Women are Angry, Temporarily Powerful and Very, Very Dangerous. It's a very provocative subtitle. And quick backstory, a woman accused Aziz of sexual assault. She accused him basically of not reading her nonverbal cues. So this was uh, brought up a big discussion this among women. This was during women. a date when they went back to his apartment. They were exactly, they were on a date, they went back to his apartment and she was a bit uncomfortable, never said anything uh, uh, as far as she didn't say no, didn't mm. say stop, but she was uncomfortable and then she wrote this letter. He, he later apologized, but this really sparked a big discussion about um, whether whether the Me Too campaign or whether an allegation like this, an accusation like this, a situation like this uh, pushes it a little bit too far and takes away any kind of agency on the woman's part. And uh, of course this, uh, this particular uh, essay, this particular piece talks about a generational gap that what used to be normal is no longer normal, but this is more than just generational. It's also cultural and it's also because we are in the midst of, of, of a revolution. We're changing something right here and there is collateral damage. But, but that, that's dangerous on two different uh, levels. First, it's dangerous because it could, dis it could have destroyed his life and uh, career and it could still it could be. Still. Uh, secondly, it falls on the journalistic or journalism of the uh, publication that actually published uh, this letter because it wasn't really uh, an assault. It wasn't really, I mean, it's, it borders line, it borderlines being even... Listen, it's still, I agree, it's not an assault, but it's still an important addition to the dis discussion because what we're asking here is not just, we're not t breaking up with just rape and sexual assault. What we're asking is the majority of, the vast majority of women have been in a situation where they They've been uncomfortable because and, of... Uh, Bianca, if I understand correctly, that this is what's so challenging here because we're moving away from a, a dating culture towards a, more of a hookup culture where people are having more casual sex outside of defining themselves as being in a relationship and it's a whole generation trying to define new norms about what is okay and what is not okay. Absolutely, that's exactly it. And in this process of defining this and redefining ourselves and breaking with the normalization of, uh, of the sexual roles, there is going to be some collateral damage and a season, sorry, uh, okay. apparently was that here. Ding, ding, press gurus round two, Mike well, Wagenheim. Well, Mike Pence, by the way, was laughed at last year when he said, I don't, I'm not alone in a room with anybody except my wife ever. People laughed at him. He said he wouldn't, wouldn't, be, wouldn't be alone with any other women. Okay, Mike, we have to get on, now. we have to get on your next story. Israel Hayom taking a look at uh, what happened on Saturday night. Attorney General Abichai Mandelblit here in Israel was accosted outside his synagogue by protesters who are demanding that he indict the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. People are saying this crossed a red line. He was trying to mourn the mother. charge protesters dispute saying they didn't actually interrupt him at prayer. He had to be escorted out after trying to mourn his mother. They say it's, it's a red line that can't be crossed. Mohammed Al Hayat Daily and the major headline also referring somewhat to uh, Trump's decision. Here we're talking about Europe will urge Abbas, Abbas uh, being the Palestinian Authority president, to wait for the American peace plan. Abbas is in Brussels uh, today, tomorrow and Tuesday. He will be giving a major speech trying to persuade the Europeans to take on a bigger major role in the uh, negotiation process. He has disqualified the Americans from being the sole uh, mediator in this uh, process. However, the Europeans, according to Al Hayat newspapers, are asking him to kind of calm down and you know, try to understand what the Americans are offering before he takes this uh, major step forward. And of course, we don't know what the Americans are offering, but there are also so tantalizing leaks, exactly. leaks, and we don't mm -hmm. know what is accurate and not. Uh, Bianca? 
Yes, um, my favorite story was this headline. Trump says Democrats are ruining his one year anniversary as a president. <laughs> and the reason I chose this is because, first of all, it's good. Second of all, it combines the two biggest stories, well, two other biggest stories this week. In the US, the government shutdown and the one year of uh, Trump in office. Uh, and it also says something- Was he expecting something... him to throw him a party? Yes, he was, and he was expecting uh, to wow. have uh, to relax be huge. in Mar to, huge, the best party. He was expecting to rest in Mar-a-Lago. He is not doing that right now, so instead he is ranting on Twitter. And being Mohammed, angry. what's new? Anyhow, well, uh, moving <laughs> on. To just comment on this because we have to go for. Well, a uh, uh, again, I don't think that uh, President Trump uh, has uh, the right as the president to really complain a lot. He is part of the problem, and if he's not part of the solution, so he should take it on and quit complaining and make and take some serious Mike, step. Mike, do you think uh, the president was really it. expecting the Democrats to throw him a party? <laughs> Absolutely, no. without a doubt. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. I think he was expecting Chuck Schumer to pop out of a cake. Yes, oh, absolutely. Okay, well, that, that that is a thought I'm not going to be able to get out of my mind. So, uh, thank you. No, thank you, Mike. You're welcome, uh, sir. Mohamed al Kassim, Mike Wagenheim, Bianca Zanini, our press gurus, thank you very much for joining us on The Spin Room. We are now going for another short break. When we come back, we're going to be back with The Spin Room Countdown, the five top stories that made me chuckle, cry, or, uh, uh, or cry with laughter in the last week. We'll be back in just a minute. Stories. Stories that touch your heart and open your eyes. Stories that take you on a journey and show you something you will never forget. Look through the lens and see what others see. High Definition, documentaries and discussions that connect us all. Join Lauren Izzo weeknights at 10.03 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. I'm David Schuster on I-24 News. Join us on Stateside. It's our channel's flagship broadcast, and it features our best reporting and analysis of news from around the world and from here in the United States. Watch Stateside, weeknights at 9 p.m. Eastern, only on I-24 News. and it's time for the Spin Room Countdown. Five moments that either made me laugh, cry, or raise one quizzical eyebrow this week. At number five is the farce surrounding Israel's new mini-markets law. Yes, Israel's ultra-Orthodox parties are sensing elections, gearing up with a new law to keep mini-markets closed on the Jewish Sabbath. The city of Ashdod started enforcing laws against opening shops on the day of rest. It's advertising for inspectors and is explicitly discriminating against Jews. That's right, no Jews allowed, Shabbos goys only. Where do the ultra-Orthodox want the secular public to buy milk on Saturdays? Maybe the same place they expect them to get married if they don't want to submit to the state rabbinate, Cyprus. Meanwhile, here's what doesn't trouble the religious conscience of Israel's clerical parties. The death penalty. Shas voted for capital punishment for terrorists, while the Sephardi chief rabbi says death is in the hands of God alone. You know what else? Expelling African asylum seekers without even processing their asylum claims. Israel is offering Eritrean and Sudanese migrants thousands of dollars in a free flight to go back home or to third countries. If they don't leave freely, they could be jailed indefinitely. You shall not wrong a foreigner for you two were foreigners in Egypt, anyone? Crickets. At number four, Britain now has a minister for loneliness. Now, this isn't a Monty Python sketch about a country that's permanently cloudy where it's rude to make eye contact with strangers on public transport. And it isn't a joke about a country that's sidelined at European summits because it's leaving the European Union and is actually talking about building a bridge to France to make sure Europe can't throw it out completely. British Prime Minister Theresa May has appointed a minister to look out for the 200,000 old people in Britain who haven't spoken to friends or relatives in over a month. Loneliness is a killer, and Britain is finally taking mental health seriously. Speaking of mental health, at number three, we have President Trump's health checkup. Yes, all those rumors swirling around Washington over the president's repetitions, sentences that never end, or reach their point in his diagnosably tenuous link to reality. In an annual checkup, Trump scored full marks on a mental health test, the doctor saying he has no mental issues, telling us that Trump's breathtaking incoherence has no explanation known to science. Dr. Jackson also revealed the president is just one pound short of being obese. That's equivalent to 
hungry in a bit of the cheeseburgers Trump reportedly eats in bed, and yet Dr. Jackson still says Trump is in excellent health, which actually means his health has deteriorated because Dr. Bornstein said his last test results were astonishingly excellent. But still, these tests produced some superlative results. I told the president that if he had a healthier diet over the last uh, 20 years, he might live to be 200 years old. I don't know. I mean, um, he uh, he has incredible uh, he has incredible genes. I just assume. I would say the answer to your question is he has incredibly good genes, and it's just the way God made him. Now I feel much more confident in your understanding of medicine, Dr. Methuselah. Some people are casting doubts on the official results, saying it's unlikely Trump has the same BMI as Colin Kaepernick. Maybe Trump could get the same toned physique if he crouched during the national anthem instead. But those casting doubts on the statistics are calling themselves girthers in a play on words on the racist birther conspiracy movement that Trump encouraged about Barack Obama. I guess as they say, what goes round comes around. But at least it grabbed the news cycle from reports Trump paid a porn actress $130,000 to keep quiet about their alleged extramarital affair. And number two, Benjamin Netanyahu's visit to India. When Narendra Modi came to Israel, we had this iconic image of the blossoming romance between the two leaders. In India, we were spoiled for choice. Take Netanyahu and Modi flying kites together. No strings attached, as Indian media jibed, because despite the friendship, India still voted at the UN to declare recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital, null and void. Or Netanyahu's visit to Gandhi's home, where the master of spin, who paints his corruption probes as a left-wing media conspiracy, literally learned how to spin a yarn. What a metaphor. And at number one, we have Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas's defiant speech. Or was it weird rant? Abbas declared the Oslo Accords dead, rejected the US as a peace mediator, yada yada, things he said before. But then he turned to President Trump and told him, may your house be destroyed. Come on. Who came out on Twitter and said that he will not waste money on the Palestinians because they refuse to negotiate? What? Really? When did we refuse to negotiate? Since you're president, we met four times and we talked about four or five more times on the phone. And I told you I'm ready to do the negotiations. In the end, the negotiations, I do not want to tell you where they are. It's a shame. Seriously? Shame. But no one knows which house Abbas wanted destroyed, whether he wanted the White House to burn down, Trump Tower to fall down, or Mar-a-Lago to fall into the sea. But then Abbas repeated all the bizarre ramblings that Western diplomats have been politely trying to ignore for the last quarter century because it doesn't fit their master plans for solving the conflict. Claiming descent from the Canaanites, then quoting the Torah to prove they were here first, as if suddenly Jewish scripture is a legitimate source of claims to the land after all. Calling Israel a colonialist enterprise that has nothing to do with Judaism, saying the Jews chose to remain in Europe during the Holocaust and some weird fable about Oliver Cromwell trying to resettle the Jews in Israel using Dutch boats. You couldn't make it up, but Abbas, Israel's partner for peace, just did. That was my countdown and that was The Spin Room. I hope you enjoyed the ride. Your regular host, Ami Kaufman, will be back in his hot seat tomorrow, 6 p.m. Tel Aviv, 8 p.m. New York. In the meantime, hang in there. It's a bumpy world.